Vec. Yeah? Vec. Yeah. Everything's fucked up. I came from the future. I think it's fucked up, man. That, why? Because, because in that future, that timeline, we didn't warn people about how on d- d- January 27th, we we're going to have a live modular media wrestling podcast where we're going to talk about the Royal Rumble. And an hour before that, we're going to have a general discussion of the month of wrestling before us. But now that I've said this, we're all good. I thought we did that at the end of the last MMWP, though. Yeah, but we didn't do it for this one. But this is an MMWP. This is welcome, everybody, to Analytical Fanboys Podcast Thing. I am your host, Simeon Scott, and I am, of course, joined by the um, chronologically impaired Chris Boingo Ryder Gaston. How are you doing, sir? The future is terrible. Is it? Is it, though? Yeah, the present's terrible, too, but... The present's, like, shitty. It's not terrible. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a watermark difference there, just slightly, <laughs> ever so slightly. Yeah. I mean, uh, what? How are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm doing okay. You can tell we haven't done this in a while. It's been it's been three weeks since we recorded the last episode because release scheduling and books take a while to read and. Meh. Um, but uh. I guess let's waste no time. Let's go ahead and get into the fact that uh, on this episode we are discussing The Time Traveler's Wife by Audrey Neffenager. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Um, It's a name. It's a a name. It's a novel. And we'll we'll talk about her a bit later because I I have a thing to say about her. It's kind of funny. Um, But uh, this is one of my favorite books. I've read it, I want to say, five times now. Um... Not the most times I've ever read a book, but up there. And, uh, yeah, I just really like it. I think it's good. And it also inspired some of the crappier plot points of Stephen Moffat's run on Doctor Who. So I thought that would be an interesting talking point. But we'll get to that later. Chris, this was your first time reading the book. Um, What did you think of it? Well, you didn't mention what it was about, first off. So, well, we kind of we kind of mentioned it. It's about a guy who time travels involuntarily like it's a uh, it's a physical illness um or a condition rather and oh, uh it's about him having his relationship with his wife where they keep meeting in the wrong order um he f- she first met him when she was 6 years old he first meets her when i think he's like 24 I finished the book a, a few days ago, so I don't remember exactly. Early twenties, early twenties. Yeah, he's early twenties, and early she already, she's already known him pretty much her whole life, and he has to experience their entire relationship in the opposite order while he's experiencing the proper adult part of their relationship, which which is a it's a very interesting storytelling device. Um, I. Like, I've not read a ton of romance novels, but this is definitely the best romance novel I've ever read just because of that storytelling device and how it it uses that to sort of talk about the nature of relationships and spending your life with someone. Um, and, uh, yeah, I really like it. It's, it's good. Uh, Chris, did you think it was good or not? I thought it was okay. Yay! Maybe because... Like, I can tell it's a good story, but it's not my kind of thing. And here's a weird thing. I'm I'm a fan of certain romance stories, but it's just, this felt too much like, this felt too much like the no- kind of novel my mom would read. Really? It, my mom loves Harlequin romance novels with the whole shirtless Scottish men on top of them. Okay. See, I always felt like this, I always took this as like, this is that kind of novel, but elevated um, a little higher in, in terms of quality and like storytelling ideas. Oh, no, I'm not saying it is one of them. I'm saying it's, it reminds me of a book that my mom would probably read and enjoy, and we just don't have often the same tastes. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, my mom, like, I'm the weird one in the family. And oh yeah, superheroes and this kind of stuff. And then okay, so you're yeah. one of you're one of those those kind of lifestyle nerds. 
And my my mom and my sister are the kind of people who continuously rewatch Friends, oh, Pretty dear. Little Liars, and Bring It On. Oh dear. Yeah, they're, they're those kind of people. Hmm. Um. So that's why it kind of reminded me because my mom does get into some speculative fantasy fiction every once in a while, but it definitely had a feel much more of uh this is a romance novel first and a sci-fi story second. Yeah. Because ultimately the, main, the big thing I got from the story is the time travel is incidental. It's a unique storytelling mechanic and you can do interesting things with it, but you can replace time travel with, Oh, he has very severe cancer and goes in and out of the hospital all the time. That's, that's fair, but I, but I think there's also a lot m- more. Also, I am being that. extremely reductive with that. It was just more of a comparison I wanted to bring up. Yeah, I I I like it just because like I feel like they go into the mechanics of how the time travel works and how that would affect someone's life and how it would kind of shape them as a person way more than I would expect it to. Like if this was straight up one of those Harlequin romance novels, it would just be. <laughs> Oh, he's gone sometimes, and that makes me sad. Um, yeah, and also it'd probably be like a little bit happier. It's like, oh, he comes back all always at the same time, mm-hmm. at the same and, time as he leaves. So it's never like gone too bad or some bullshit like that. And um, have you seen the movie adaptation of this book? Uh, bits and pieces. I rewatched it for this video, and I. And I'd seen it originally the after the first time I read the book, I went out and rented the movie because it had been out and it had been out for about a year or two at that point. Um, and I and my reaction to it at that point was just kind of like, it's all right, it's an okay adaptation. I went and rewatched it for this podcast, and um, it's the most stripped down adaptation I have ever seen. Like it is Power Rangers Samurai levels of stripped down. It's it's literally just that. He's gone, and it makes me sad. Um, I mean, Gomez is barely fucking can't... in it, and he's like one of the main side characters, and that baffles me. It feels like they just cut him out because they were f- afraid of the communism jokes. Uh, never be afraid of communism jokes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, um, I mean, it's understandable when you go from a 10-hour book to a uh, one-hour, ninety, like a 90-minute film. Mm-hmm. Books should be a, 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 a adapted as miniseries, not movies. That's always Which is what's happening with this book. book. Oh, they're doing that? Stephen Moffat's writing it. Because of course he is. <laughs> I just got you really excited. Yeah, you, and you, then you made it crash down. You know what? Down. I will summarize that with a Stephen... No, it's a Neil Gaiman, but a Stephen Moffat era Doctor Who quote. You gave me hope and then you took it away. That's enough to make anyone dangerous. <sighs> uh, but, um, yeah, do you want to jump right into that? Because, holy fuck, this is literally just Stephen Moffat's entire era of Doctor Who, but done way better. Yeah, I think it's mostly because you don't have any of the other ancillary sci-fi bullshit. Mm-hmm. And you don't have the constant, the, the weird speech about how, like, make it, being wanting to be in love with the Doctor is like wanting to be in love with the side of a mountain. Like, There still... are people who are in love with bridges, so it's not impossible. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, that's still one of the dumbest moments in Doctor Who epi- in hi- Doctor Who history, but that but this isn't who we am reviewing. So, um, do you have any like uh, interesting notes or comments related to the book you want to get into? Uh, nothing I can think of. I was more because you're a fan of the book. I was kind of going like, oh, I'll just follow his lead and pipe up on <laughs> things I want to talk about. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll go ahead and say that like my main criticism of the book is that the format is a little weird because it jumps around in time a lot, but not in a way that specifically makes sense. Like, I feel like if you were going to do something like this, you would make it either the entire book is from Henry's chronological order. Henry is the name of the guy who time travels. It it would either entirely be from his chronological memory of things, 
or it would be entirely from Claire's chronological memory of things. And it's not, it jumps back and forth in perspective a lot. And like we get the first couple chapters about them meeting and falling in love for the first time. And then there's a ton of chapters about Claire seeing Henry as a little girl. And then we jump back to present and occasionally we get chapters of Claire as a little girl before I'm like, this this seems like there was something very specific Audrey Neffernager wanted to write, and she had to find a framing device for it. And then when she realized she had to finish that framing device as the main plot of the book, she kept coming back to that specific thing she wanted to write as a way of rewarding her for making progress on the book. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that kind of that kind of organization that kind of well, this organization kind of puts you into perspective of the couple yeah i guess that can be said for it it's it's just like because it, they're it, very disorganized and they're going like what the fuck like they're trying to go okay they're trying to catch up each other up all the time mm-hmm. so like, reading the book like that you go you're trying to keep in mind all this stuff just like they are and it puts you in that kind of sympathetic, uh, empathic mode of reading it because you're you're experiencing it just as much as they are, and you're going like, "Ah, oh, shit." Yeah, I will say one of my favorite moments in the book is that chapter where their daughter, who also time travels, shows up as like a few years older than she currently is, and they take both of them out for ice cream, and the mom and Claire asks. Uh, so what's going on in your life right now? And and she says nothing much. And then Henry pipes in, "Well, well you're at a, you're in a play at school." And she goes, "I am." And he goes, "Oh, that's probably not for another year. Sorry." <laughs> huh, yeah, yeah. I mean, time uh, travel. We'll do that shit for you. Yeah, and like that is what that is like. My favorite chunk of the book is a, after they manage to be able to have a child because like there's a whole chunk of the book where they're trying to have a kid and can't because it keeps time traveling out of claire's womb and she's out and she has miscarriages because of that and it's really fucking depressing but after they have the kid um and it's like just talking about them as parents i really dug that because um i think this is incredibly unorthodox for someone someone of my generation but i'm very excited to eventually become a parent so i'm always interested in reading like happy stuff about being a parent and like interesting different takes on that and um i just found their their relationship with their daughter very interesting and i almost wish there was a sequel to this about the daughter's life that'd be interesting Mm -hmm. um because like that's that's also a thing that they kind of leave up in the air is like she could potentially get a cure but we don't ever see like a really old version of her, so maybe she did take it, maybe she didn't. It just it depends. Yeah. Um so one of the reasons I put this on the list was I very specifically wanted to know what do you think of these people's musical tastes? Because they make some references that I had to look up the first time I read this book. The first time I, I read this book and I was paying attention to the musical stuff. Uh, it's a lot of classic stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's not really my kind of wheelhouse. Like, I mean, I just accepted it for what it was. Because uh, the mom, the, the time traveler's mom sings opera, dudes in an orchestra, dudes' dads in an orchestra. So it's just like, eh, it's what they were. And it probably gives uh, the story a timeless feeling because yeah. they're not trying to talk about pop culture. But but then they do. Like, Henry, there's that whole chapter about Henry being a punk and talking to two kids who are punks and, like, why are why are they into something that happened before they were born? That That was a really interesting, like, quick meditation on how pop culture can come back and how certain things can come back into the pop culture. Yeah, but punk never died. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, because punk kind of started in the 70s, continued in the 80s. It just, mm-hmm. punk moves where it was. In the 70s, it was in England. In the 80s, it was in New York. Then the 90s, it was in California. Hmm. Interesting. I don't know a lot about punk. That's one of the other reasons why I was interested in to hear what you thought about it. 
because I figured you might. I don't know yeah, why. Yeah, 70s, punk kind of, like, really took off in the 70s in England. And that's also where, like, skinheads came from, where mm-hmm. ska really kind of got its first, eh, second, second wave. It's second wave uh, of popularity because in the 50s it was in Jamaica, 70s and 80s it was in England, and that was heavily associated with the punk scene. But that punk was The Clash, Sex Pistols, stuff like that. Yeah, the stuff Henry's into. (laughs) Yeah, that kind of stuff. But then it moved to New York, and that stuff like Ramones was part of that kind of stuff, but it evolved into uh, a harder core scene and... That also was part of California, and that was stuff like Black Flag, stuff, uh, that kind of hard stuff, and the germs, and all that kind of thing. And that kind of grew over there in Cali, uh, which eventually if, uh, influenced grunge, hmm. uh, and Kurt Cobain, and all that kind of stuff, but also eventually influenced uh, pop punk, like uh, Green Day, Blink-182, Sum 41, and eh, Sum 41's not really pop punk, uh, Offspring. Hmm. Uh, and then pop punk and skate punk and all that kind of stuff just evolved more. And then you get like hardcore, post hardcore, screamo, which is more related to that. Just put more metal back into it. And interesting. Yeah. See, I figured you would know that kind of shit because, like, I'm a big classic rock guy, but I don't. I I I I like dabble in punk, but I don't know a whole lot about it. And Metal is something that I'm always like, oh yeah, I should get into some metal. And then I listen to some metal and it's just, it completely turns me off. I'm sorry, Fuse, you, I don't get it. Here's the thing. Fuse on like metal level 15, you need to start on metal level 1. Mm. <laughs> you need to start with the plebe shit before you can get into the dope shit. So you're saying I should go listen to Metallica? Early Metallica, Kill 'Em All, up till Black Album. That's mm. probably the safest bet. And does you... ACDC count as metal? Because I do like them quite a bit. No. Okay. <laughs> they ain't. They, they eh, nah. They I don't know shit metal. about music, people. So, uh, Metallica's thrash. Then you have you have the four Godfathers of thrash, which is Slayer, Metallica, um. Slayer, Metallica, Anthrax, and Megadeth. They're the huh. four. They're the four fathers of uh, thrash, which is heavy metal kicked up a notch with punk. I see. And then you have like that. Like, and then you get into the weird Scandinavian shit, and, and partially Florida because Florida also birthed like the death metal scene or the black metal scene. I can't remember. <laughs> It makes sense that Florida would birth something called death metal. Yeah. Um, and then you got a bunch of shit. Then you have industrial, which is like nine inch nails and all that kind of guff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, music's fun. Music's weird. Yeah, it is. Um, getting back to this book, which is also fun, I think. Um, how. Like. I'm I'm trying to figure out a way to word this, but like, there's a very specific feel that I think this book has, and I want to know if you were able to jive with that really well. Like, there's a very, very homely feel about about this book. Like, um, Henry Henry describes in like one of the opening chapters about how like all his pleasures are homely ones, and I feel like the book is trying very hard to sell you on stuff like that because. There's that whole bit after they get married about what it's like um, for a young couple to get used to living together. Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff about just relationships in general. And it all, it never feels overly sappy to me. It all feels like um, Nefenegger is to a certain degree writing from experience. Well, I also, when we got this thing, I read through the Wikipedia page a little bit and she said it, the book is heavily inspired by actual relationships of hers. Hmm. Um, if I remember right, it's just because certain relationships ended bad or were wonky in a certain way and it kind of inspired it. So it may just be like a part of like, I don't want to say wish fulfillment, but kind of like, and eh, if shit goes bad, at least they're, they have something nice to go back to. 
That's yeah, comforting. well, that, comforting. that makes a whole lot of sense because, like, have you seen a picture of her? Uh, I think she looks exactly like Claire, like exactly the way I picture Claire is the way she looks, but a bit older. And I didn't see a picture of her until I, this read through. Like, I went and did some research, and I was like, "Holy shit, she! This is is this self insert?" I think it. I think it. Uh, hold on, let me. Because I read the Wikipedia page, pay, uh, page for the book, mm-hmm. and it was, uh, doo, 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 and it said stuff like that. No, it wasn't necessarily a self insert, but it was heavily inspired by her life. So, doo, doo, doo. Mm-hmm. there we go. Here's the Wikipedia page. Uh, plot summary. Uh, yeah, and like hell, she works at Ch- uh, uh, Chicago. Which is where mm-hmm. the book story takes place. And, like, it makes sense because people always say, oh, if you're going to be a writer, write what you know. And she clearly knows Chicago very well or did a lot of research on the city for this book because she she has, like, detailed stuff about street names and um, certain, sh- certain like, um, family-owned shops in the area. It's really interesting. Uh, here's a quote from her. I got the idea for the title, and when I draw, I have a big drawing table covered with brown paper, and I write ideas down on paper. So I wrote down this title, and after a while, I started to think about it. I couldn't think of a way to make it a picture book, because I still, because still pictures don't represent time very well, so I decided to write a novel. Hmm. Yeah. Henry is not only married to Claire, he is also married to time. Story is a metaphor for her own failed love affairs, and that quote, "I had a kind of an idea that there's no, there's not going to be some fabulous, perfect soulmate out there for me, so I'll just make them up." Yeah, it's self insert. Yeah, and there's a picture of her. Yeah, it's very, it's very kind of that, that romantic idea of faded, beautiful yet slightly tragic love. Mm-hmm. Which you know, which you know, is is one of the oldest kind of love stories ever told. But I feel like this book does it in a in a pretty fresh way because I don't think I've ever seen time travel as a physical impairment in anything else, even stuff that's come out after this book. Like the only thing that comes close is Tracer from Overwatch. See, I don't know shit about Overwatch except I've seen the character designs. Is yeah, that Tracer... how Tracer's power works? I think so. Hold on. Because I saw that first CGI trailer with her and the gorilla guy fighting in the museum. And I thought she was just teleporting around, but I I don't know. That's what it looked like. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it is. Hmm. Hold on. Boop, boop, boop. Yep, Tracer has low health, but is highly mobile, and her skills include teleportation and time travel. Cool. Those abilities were caused by an accident that left her unable to maintain a physical form in the present until Winston invented a chronal accelerator, a device that allows her to control her own time. I see. Hmm. Yep. So yeah, same basic, uh, same basic illness. Interesting. Um, I wonder. I wonder if the person who came up with Tracer has read this book, or they just thought of that. That'd be an interesting thing to ask. Um, gaming press people get on that interview, but uh, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't know. I feel like this is a this is a really like solid take on that as well, because like it's very clear that she came up with that, and she was like, well, if I'm gonna do that as a plot device. I need to have rules. So what are the rules? How is this going to work? And like, I almost wonder if the scene where Kendrick first starts asking him questions about how the illness works was like a conversation she had with the character in her head. It's very possible, especially because you're trying to set up a world. Mm-hmm. Um, and it feels, it feels very... Like, I know people like to throw around the word realistic and grounded to describe certain types of fiction as being good nowadays, but, like, 
those are the words to describe this. It's not, it's like, there's even like a, a so not a subplot, but like a, a certain little thing that's brought up where when Henry was younger and he was being trained in how to time travel by his older self, he thought his older self came from a secret society of time travelers and that it was this <laughs> magical, whimsical power. And he's like, no, that's the thing about Tiggers. We're the only one. And it's kind of fucked, but it's, 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 mm. they go into complete detail about how fucked it is and how crazy it would make your life. And one of the chapters that has always stuck with me, like, even when I've gone like a year or so without reading this book, um, when he gets stuck in the cage and he's just so half defeated and half cracked up by the fact that it finally happened. Like, that felt so real to me. Yeah. Like, that's lo- that felt like an almost like an allegory for your co-workers figuring out you're gay after years of you dropping hints. Yeah. Um, so were there any, uh, any, like, side characters in this you particularly latched on to? Like, like I said, it's just... A- because I was reading it because I, uh, for this, and it was an okay book, it's like, nah. I just want to focus on the story. Okay, that's fair. Like, um, they're fine. Yeah, it's- there are no bad characters in this. Um, they're all, like, very standard um, people in a relationship movie, but they, all, but they all work really well. They fill their roles pretty well, and they have their own quirks to them. Um... Like, um, Gomez and Charisse could have easily just been two normies, but instead they're like these weird art, um, pol- political, um, college people who end up being friends with Claire and Henry for their entire life. And I'm, and it's, it's, om- it feels like, again, Neffenegger would have had to have known a couple that was like that in order to write that. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot um, of characters end up like that in books, especially if you're, they're like side characters, because yeah. you can't go super hard in detail for them because, oh, they're just on the side, so you just go like, I'm just going to write this person I know. Hmm. Hmm. Um, trying to think if there's anywhere else I want to go. Were there cuz I've talked about a few. Were there any like chapters that specifically stuck out to you as like, oh, this was a, this is a really good use of this concept or something like that? No, nah, because it kind of went uh, all at once. They kind of all washed together and smushed. Hmm. I see. Um that tends to happen when I read books. Like I can barely remember what happens when when I read American Gods. See, that happens to me with, um, like, books I either don't like or I'm just ambivalent towards. But if I like a book, like, certain scenes will latch on to me and stick in my mind for months. Like, I remember the first time I I read this through, um, the scene where Henry helps young Claire um, get revenge on this guy who abused her on a date. Like, I that was like, holy shit. That was an awesome scene. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I guess there's not much else we can say except me just going like that scene was good. So, uh, um, Chris, would you, would you recommend the book to people at all? Yeah, it wasn't my thing, but I definitely say like if it's if anything that we have said interests you go check it out mm-hmm. yeah i i i feel like it's it's one of those books where it's like if you don't read anything else in this genre this is a good one this would be the good one to be just that one because like let's be honest romance novels is one of are one of those novel genres that are just almost always trash but this one is like this is this is like taking all of those cliches and stuff and saying like, well, what if we tried to try to do something that wasn't so formulaic and boring and just trying to fill a need in someone's life? What if we tried yeah, to tell an actual that. story here? 
I commend that concept. Just, mm-hmm. again, not my thing. And that's fair enough. Um, at least it wasn't a back level reaction. Yeah. I'm yeah. still salty against you for that. <laughs> oh, don't worry. You'll get revenge on me one day, I'm sure. Oh, I've already gotten it with subjecting you to everything else I've subjected you to. But nothing else you have subjected me to has made me mad in the way Beck made me mad. No, but it made you crazy. That's fair enough. You did make me pull pull an all-nighter because I couldn't handle the end of something. Uh, which was that? That That was Animal Man. Oh, right. Yeah. I thought it might have been uh, 17,776. No, that was that was just like I had to I had to go and have a breather, but I finished that in the middle of the day, so it was fine. All right, cool. Um so do you want to go ahead and move on to fucked up fruit facts with Chris? You can speed up the ripening of a pineapple by standing it upside down on its leafy head. That makes sense, because I imagine those leaves wouldn't take so well to pressure. And you're exposing the actual fruit part to the sun a little more. Yeah. Neat. Neat. Alright. Well, shall we find out what we will be discussing next time and hopefully not taking three weeks to get through? Yeah, it shouldn't take as long. Just shit happened. Yeah, there, there was that, um... I mean, like, I don't want to throw you under the bus because I understand being a slow reader. That's why I switched to audiobooks, because I can get through an audiobook in, like, three days tops. But I read the book twice and then watched the movie in the time it took you to read the book once. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, I wouldn't have read it a second time for the show, but a week went by and I was like, uh, I might... If we get into a really detailed conversation, I might forget things. So I better go ahead and re-listen to it now. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and find out that the next thing we will be talking about on Analytical Fanboys is... Gorilla's Phase 1 Celebrity Takedown, which it was a suggestion by you. Ooh, we're getting into music. Yeah, we're going back to the music sphere, which is which is uh, cool. We haven't done any music in a bit, and uh, Gorillaz is a thing that I don't know very much about, but have wanted to get into for a while. Not since the latest album came out. I'm not one of those people. I'm just it's one of those things that it's always been there, and I've been like, I should look into that, and then I never do. But now I will. Um, the big thing about this is I want to talk about partially the story. That's why I didn't put uh, the Geep album. Which is, which is, I think, the fan name for the first album, because I think it was self-titled. Mm. But it has a car that has the name Geep on it. G-E-E-P. Mm. But there's also a little bit of story and several music videos around this phase, including like several short films. So I'll make you like a playlist of everything that is yeah, part of Phase 1. Yeah, I remember saying one. you would have to do that. And everything that's part of Phase 1. So that's the Geep album... The Gorillas short films that were released on their website, and no, the 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 Flash tour was part of Phase Two, and at least maybe have you read the Wikipedia page for Phase One on the Gorillas wiki? Hmm. Um. Yeah, because it's not as it's not as detailed. It only gets like super weirdly detailed at like Plastic Beach. I see. Which is phase three. All right. Well, you can just send me to Google Doc whenever you have it ready, and I'll, I'll, I'll give this stuff a look, and we'll probably be back next week. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, this has been a, been a little decent little episode. So, uh, Chris, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody where they can find you on the Internet and what you do. I can be found on YouTube uh, with the username Boingo Writer. Uh, on Twitter at Boingo underscore writer and do I have any, uh, Discord in the description? Mm-hmm. I do video editorials, less authoritative than a video essay, uh, where I give my opinion and shit. Um, I talk about a variety of nerdy stuff. All right. 
Yeah. Um, I am Simeon Scott, particularly that Simeon Scott. That is my username on Twitter. You can find me there. I've also got an Instagram with that username. I'm on YouTube as Simeon Scott, but I also do a uh, multi-channel storyline thing called the Vacuuminator Saga involving the Vacuuminator himself, Ranger T, and a couple other characters that we may or may not have met yet. Um, my latest video in that saga is a, a video analysis of Common Rider Wizard discussing why I think it's an incredibly underrated tokusatsu show. Um, and uh, on my personal channel, I just do vlogs or photo montages or whatever I want to do at the time. And uh, yeah, go check out my shit, people. And you should also check out the shit that's made by Modular Media because we are a podcast that is produced by them them being us uh you can go ahead and uh subscribe to the channel so you get every episode of this podcast as it comes out you can also download the podcast as an mp3 by going to the link in the description to the google drive folder um we have a twitter which is at the modular media where we uh post updates on shows that are coming out and goofs and gaffs and all kinds of stuff like that and we have uh a subreddit where we do basically the same thing but on reddit so go check that out if you're a redditor and i think that will do it for us so um thanks everyone for listening and we will see you next time when we will be discussing the first phase of gorillas remember i'm happy it's in a bag the sunshine i'm feeling glad yeah i'm sure i'll understand that in a bit